At approximately 5 p.m. this afternoon, a semi-trailer unit collided with a pasture bus carrying members of the Humboldt Broncos. The team was on its way from Humboldt, Saskatchewan to Nipawin, where it was set to play game five of a playoff series against the local team, the Hawks. There's 29 families, 16 passed, 13 are survivors, and of all those survivors, nobody's 100%. There's survivor guilt, brain injuries, there's all kinds of things. Every day it's, it's hour by hour, it's an emotional roller coaster. It's up and down, up and down. It was part of my life that affected me, but I don't want it to be something that defines me. I feel that if I was on the other side of this, I would want them to live their life to the fullest as well and continue the season on behalf of us. I think this year will shape a lot of our lives for the rest of our lives. When he was a kid, he'd be up at five Take shots till late Make the thing drive Out after school Back on the ice That was his life Gonna play in the big league Started playing competitive hockey when I was about four I started playing hockey when I was about three years old, three or four. I first started playing hockey when I was four. Played hockey since probably five years old. You become best friends with 20 new people every year and it's just something that's special. You just, the bond between players. It's like another family and it's the greatest feeling on earth just knowing you always have that many guys there for you every single day just to be part of your life. I like, first came and I didn't really know what to expect. It's like a, a little, it's like a town, it's a city. People love the Broncos. People support us through and through, no matter what the situation is, no matter winning, losing. There's always people in the stands that are always cheering us on and people are saying hi to us when we walk down the street. And it's just a friendly place. It's a place you don't have to really worry about anything. It's a small town feel. place that you want to live. I've said since day one that I want to come back. We're gonna go one, then two. Pretty much from day one, when we found out like our injuries weren't going to be as serious as some others, it was kind of like both of our goals to be back. We were both going to come back and represent the 29 families, the 29 people that were on the bus, and that's kind of what we, what our goal was, and what we were working towards all summer. You kind of get used to walking in and seeing the same guys, making the same jokes, and then having to come back this year and having a completely different group it took a little while to get used to. I didn't know if I was going to be able to return just because of my injuries. Physically, I'm probably at like 98%, but I didn't know mentally if I was going to be okay. And emotionally, you know, it's it's been tough. It's, you know, you got a lot to think about. Um, I think about all the other guys every day. I think about the boys aren't here anymore, but, you know, I love to play it, and I'm just happy to be here in honor of them. I'm helping the team by helping scout this year. So at training camp, I was helping pick the team, like especially goalies, because they don't got a lot of guys that have played the position that really know the ins and outs of goaltending, and you have to kind of do it to know it. So I was just doing my part. I uh, broke my back at the T9, T10 level, so paralyzed from the waist down. You got to relearn everything, kind of day-to-day -day life is a little bit different. 
I spent six weeks in rehab. I was in the hospital longer, but it was just focused on trying to get better. And then I'm young and was an athlete my whole life. So it, all that kind of helps. I suffered a third degree brain injury. How's it going? In. I should be in a uh, vegetative state. Hey, the person doing? behind me on the bus, my roommate passed away with a fourth degree uh, brain injury. And so uh, some people actually pass away with third degree brain injuries as well with excessive bleeding. And my doctor, I guess, uh, after my results got sent to him, he called my parents and was like, I'm very, very sorry. And my parents were with me at the time. They were like, oh, like, why are you sorry? And he's like, his results say that he doesn't know who you guys. And by the pictures that I've been seeing right now, he for sure should not know you guys. My dad's like, I think you need to come here because he's been talking to us. And so I can remember my parents, my name, how to walk, talk, eat, and people in my life. That's why I'm called a miracle. I'll definitely miss playing for the Broncos. Humboldt was a great town and community for me, and it was one of the best hockey seasons I've had. It's great to see hockey back in Humboldt. It really is. It's great to see these young athletes working hard, trying to put a win, you know, W up on the board, those kinds of things. Uh, it's great to see Nathan behind the bench doing well. That boys, that's it. Get a drink, get a drink. Hockey's my passion, uh, coaching part. I uh, decided I wanted to coach six, seven, eight years ago, just to kind of give back to the game. And that's it, that's it, fellas, that's it, nice. Try to help players get to where I got. I took this exact same route. I played junior hockey, and then from there, fulfilled my dream of playing in the NHL. Nathan's awesome. He's been there to support me through everything, but he also is intense. He expects us to come out every night, work hard, and we just have to play the way he wants, and I think our team's gonna be very successful this year. It's not hard, is it? Can we go one more each on defense? I'm here to help kids hopefully fulfill their dreams, but I'm also here to try to help them become better human beings. The hockey world is full of a bunch of good people, and that's because we have a bunch of great coaches. So hopefully I can be one of those people too. These drills are not a race, right? It's timing, focus, details, tape to tape, okay? It's a tough place to be right now, and it's probably one of the most difficult jobs in hockey. It's hard to watch other guys behind the bench. Like every time I look at the bench, it should be Darcy. I knew that whoever came in was not gonna be Darcy. They were not going to be the same coaching style of personality. Darcy was really passionate about his coaching and he gave so much. He just had a way of connecting with guys off the ice on such a personal level. I mean, he was never afraid to tell you how he really felt. He was super honest and uh, his coaching style was fantastic. Darcy knew that he was the head coach and he, he still had fun with us and he still made his dad jokes and stuff like that, but it was a lot easier for us to connect with Mark. He was fresh out of the game and uh, being an assistant coach, you're not the main guy, but overall he was a very good assistant coach. A coach shouldn't be a friend, but he was a friend. There was a line there, but it wasn't the same kind of line that a head coach would have. He fit the liaison between the players and the head coach quite well. And then Dana's, uh, she was a good support system as well. She was uh, approachable and it felt comfortable when you're in a room. If you didn't want to go to the head coach, you could easily go to them. A couple of the moms from the, the team told me that uh, she was the mother hen. Another one told me she's the one that kept everybody going and everybody organized. I had my concerns with her working in a, in a male-dominated role like that, but she was used to being the only girl in a lot of stuff. We were told a story after she passed from somebody here in town that their daughter wanted to take Taekwondo, and they said, well, there's no girls taking it, you'd be the only girl. 
And she said, well, Dana's playing hockey, she's the only girl. <laughs> if she can do that, I can take Taekwondo. So already she had changed somebody's attitude at a young age. The mining company had donated $5,000 to every rink of all the deceased on the bus. And they asked us what we want them to do with it. And Dana always had to dress in closets and in offices. And so we thought, well, it'd be nice if they would make a girl's dressing room. I think they captured her pretty good. Once hockey starts, you sort of get back into that routine and uh, get back to a little bit of normal. Whatever normal is, you know. Obviously the beginning was pretty emotional, getting back out on the ice in a real game for the first time. There's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of people watching. And from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, forward number 26, Brandon Calabrese! It was pretty nerve-wracking. I just felt like so many people were kind of watching me and had eyes on me and, you know, it was tough to stay composed the whole entire time. We're also honored to have an attendance member of the last season's Rocky team. It was probably one of the toughest nights of my life, but standing with the other survivors uh, meant a lot, and uh, to be able to know that they were beside you and uh, doing this for them. I can imagine the emotions that were going through their mind that night. Even though we lost that game, that the outcome of the game really didn't matter as much as I wanted to win, and it was obviously serving a greater purpose, but it was, uh, it was definitely a motion-filled night. I'm taking down the rivers we put up uh, after the accident. My wife and my two daughters put them all up all over town, and it came from the entire ribbon around the old oak tree, you know. We want our boys to come home safe. I figured the first game is over, it's time for them to come down. I wish I could have been in the home opener, but I didn't want to rush it and I didn't want to force myself to go play when uh, there was another chance of getting hurt. There's more injuries than people know. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to disclose all my injuries that I'm still uh, recovering from. Overall, I think it was good to let my body heal the way I wanted to. 
Any parent would be very worried to send their kid back into uh, obviously physical junior hockey, especially imagine for them sending their kid off again after what happened would not be easy. At the end of the day, I think they understood where my head was at and why I wanted to do this. I juggled with it a ton, but I think it was a spontaneous decision and I just wanted to be back here. So October 13th, I uh, just got up and went. Once he kind of said, you know what, I'm gonna come back, I wanna be back, it was kind of like, oh, like this is gonna happen, like this is unbelievable, I'm super excited for him. Smitty's one of those guys you just love to have around the rink, he's a guy you love having in the dressing room. Zip it around, let's go! Move it, move it, move it! Middle lane drive on the three on two. You know, coming into this job, I knew Braden and Derek would be back. Um, and there were whispers of possibly a third player named Tyler Smith. And obviously, you know, I got in touch with Smitty and I was never gonna push him to come. If you wanna come, great. There's a spot open for you and we'll continue to leave that spot open for you for as long as you need. And when he finally made his decision, I was excited. The guys loved him, the guys respected him. It sucked not seeing a couple uh, numbers on the board and a couple numbers uh, on my line and stuff like that, but as soon as I stepped out, it seemed like I got a standing ovation, so that was uh, definitely made me feel good and uh, gave me a little more uh, peace of mind during the game. That was awesome. He's one of the first friends that I had, and uh, yeah, it was unbelievable. Standing on that blue line was, it was tough. Uh, obviously, I made a lot of big steps over the past little bit, but this was just kind of a different thing. It uh, felt good, but it was still tough. I know they were there with me, so I, it was an emotional night, but at the end of the day, I came back uh, for one main reason, to play for them. Just about six months today, one day short of six months, he was in the hospital. He was in a medically induced coma for roughly a month. That was a very long time to be in the hospital day after day. He did have uh, fractured ribs and bruised organs, a lot of broken bones in his face, but uh, the main recovery right now is, is the brain injury. We talked to him right through, but for him to acknowledge us or answer back with a yes or no was probably after three months. It was a long time and, and I remember every day just couldn't wait to hear his voice and it's so happy now that it's starting to come back. What did we do yesterday? Uh, uh, Shop period. Shopping. <laughs> we didn't get shoes. And jeans. <laughs> Now that we're out of the hospital, he has uh, physiotherapy every morning. Last one, trying to go slow on the way down again. He's four days a week right now, and speech therapy every afternoon, five days a week. And when he has some downtime, we do go to the gym on the side, and he does go on the treadmill, he does work out, and just walks, and it's, it's a all day, every day process. Uh, he's lots, lots of work ahead of him, but he's working really hard every day. And, and it's, it's the main, the brain injury is what we're trying to overcome right now. Every day, it's hour by hour. It's an emotional roller coaster. It's up and down, up and down. And uh, we're just so thankful that we have him with us. And, but it's tough. Today is our first away game against Nip One. Woke by midnight all alone. Today will be uh, probably another emotional game. Were you even thinking of me? This is where the 2017 2018 team didn't return from. Is it even a possibility? It won't be fun to go on the bus to Nip One today. The, the event that happened really affected a lot of people and there are a lot of eyes on us and there are a lot of people watching so we're going to continue to go out and compete and work hard and try to honor the people that can't play or that were lost.
I've never been away from home. It's a transition, but as soon as I got here, my billets are phenomenal. When you're a billet, you end up building this relationship with a person or a boy that's, you know, not maternally or, or paternally yours, but they become just as close. It's just like having an, another son. It felt good this morning that there was that pair of shoes there. My billets, uh, they've billeted for, I think, 13 years, so they're pretty experienced. Like, they kind of just welcome me right away. So you started kicking at home? I spend my days alone. <laughs> that sounded sad. <laughs> it sounds no. sad. I'll whip up some stir fries. I know what's going on. OK. They pretty much move in. You meet them when they come to the door. We start by giving them a bed and the Wi-Fi password and a key to the door, and we just share life with them. How did I get that black eye? Was that in LaRange? What happened? It seems so minimal compared to the well, teeth, yeah, compared right? To the teeth hey, part. this time last year, we were blending this yeah, cauliflower. Yeah, we were. So you have these boys that come into the team as a Bronco for their first time. The way that they are when you first talk to them, they're usually nervous or like really excited with their personality at the beginning of this season and then throughout the season to the end of this season is totally different. So it's rewarding watching them go from a nervous person to someone who's so confident and comfortable and just to who they really are. They sit at our table, they poke through our fridge, they just become members of the family. I don't like these shots. Don't follow it. Certainly our billets last year. Tyler and Parker, they took on the role of billet brothers and certainly sons, and we would sit at the table here and talk. And we had a close relationship with those two young men. They're very special to us. Well, and it was easy with Parker, because he is, a like me, a bit of an academic, and he actually liked talking about the news and current events. Parker and I connected, and that's one of the reasons the loss was really hard. But it's also a blessing, because there was love there. How much was it? Four bucks? Yeah, well, we're just sitting out <laughs> <laughs> Why do you hate me today? No, I'm kidding, man. I could, I just, I just feel like you don't have the, or like the coordination. Is you. It is nice to have Derek and Brayden here just because like even if you're having a bad day you can just say do you want to hang out. I'm a big locker room guy so uh, to be able to put myself in pretty much a completely new locker room is definitely tough. Uh, seeing stalls filled with people that weren't there last year and kind of should be here this year is definitely tough. I'll never have a dressing room atmosphere like we did last year. He gave me a heads up, he kind of said like he wasn't doing the best and I understood exactly what he meant and what he was feeling. So I respect him for the decision and it was, I think it was best for him. In our quote unquote exit meeting, he wanted to explain everything. And you know, Tyler's a guy that wants to make sure people understand. And finally I kind of had to stop him and just be like, Smitty, I get it. Like, you don't owe me an explanation. You don't owe me anything. Like, I'll never understand what any of these guys have been through, you know? And to me, all of them even being here and Putting on the Broncos sweater is a huge win. Anything after that is a bonus. I'm glad I went back. I'm glad I tried. And I don't really have to live with what would happen if I played. I can kind of just recover properly and start doing my own thing. Everybody heals differently. But uh, at the end of the day, I think there's a certain time and place where uh, you need to set yourself back and really be able to let your emotions take over.
Obviously, at some point, you have to put your life over your hockey career, and that's what he did. Some days are better than others. Sometimes things hit you, and you're not expecting them to hit you. It could be something just driving home, and a vehicle drives by, and you think, oh, I'm going to tell Logan about that and, oh, I can't, and then so that affects you. So we were in a Humboldt the week of the crash. We knew Logan's junior hockey career was possibly nearing to the end. Um, they'd lost the first two games to Nip One. The bus left, and so we picked up uh, Logan's billet brother and the three of us are driving, and then we're getting close to an intersection, and it's like, oh, something happened. Oh, there's a semi-trailer rolled over. There's stuff all over the place. So we slow down. There's a few cars, not very many. And all of a sudden, McLaren goes, I saw a Bronco's bag in the ditch. What? So I pull over to the side, and then all of a sudden, a lady knocks the window, and she says, that's a humble Bronco bus just crashed. Do you have any blankets? I grab two blankets, and I just go to the crash site, and it's like right there. I was there before there was first responders. Right at the intersection in Melford, we made that left-hand turn and one ambulance goes by, two ambulances go by, three ambulances go by, you start seeing the stars, air ambulance, and you know, at first you think, okay, bus was in an accident. Usually they're pretty safe, and then you hear it's a semi, and then you see all the vehicles, and you're like, okay, this is bad. We came right to the junction where we should have turned and that's right where this, the semi was turned over and it just looked like a semi. You couldn't see the bus behind it. You could see something black, but I thought it was just something to do with the semi. It likely happened just minutes before. One of the board members phoned me. She said she couldn't get a hold of anyone, so I tried calling Darcy's phone a couple times and he didn't answer. So then I tried Mark's phone and he didn't answer pulled up and there was four or five sets of parents already in front of us and and you could see the front end of the bus was obliterated. I knew right then that he was gone. I just knew roughly where he'd have been being a rookie towards the front of the bus. So I'm there and I started helping and doing stuff, because everybody's doing stuff. So then I started, got on my hands and knees, and we, a bunch of us kind of crawled under the bus, started pulling out the peat moss. So I tried everybody's phones again. So I tried Darcy's phone, and I tried Mark's phone, and then Mark's phone phoned me back. Now I realized that someone must have just bumped the phone, and my number was the last one that had called, so it just called it back. But I sat there and listened. By then, the ambulance, like, all the people had been there, so you could hear are you taking this person to this hospital? You know, like just stuff like that. So I just sat on the phone and like screamed and screamed their names, trying to hopefully someone would hear and pick up the phone, but um, just listen to the accident scene for about, I don't know, 20 minutes. And then finally just realized that no one was going to talk and I hung up. By this time the ambulance was there and they're, and they're taking people out and I'm trying to identify, is that Logan, is that Logan? And then an RCMP officer came up to me and said, I hear your son's on this bus. And I said, yes, you have to leave. And then we got told to go to the church in Nippon and we went. We we're the first ones at the church. We we're at a church and the Nippon Hawks were sitting quietly in the corner, just in a circle with their heads down. They stayed there the whole time. And they called us into the back room with the RCMP and the RCMP guy basically said if we read your son's name they're at a hospital and if your son's name isn't on this list then they're still at the scene. I feel so badly for this RCMP officer he was a great big mountain of a man and his eyes were glassy and he said I'm so sorry he said this is we've never dealt with anything like this before. So they read off all the names. You can see some of the parents, you know, they got my boy, 
he's at this hospital and just the relief in their eyes and then you could see they'd look at you and you're still sitting there. When you were just praying that you know your kid's name would come up, but by nine, nine o'clock, there was no name, so you knew. And then Scott phoned at, it was about nine o'clock. You wake up that morning thinking everything is great. And then you try to go to bed and it's not. The world's completely not the same. And it will never be. It will never be. Since that day, we've just been numb. Pastor Sean from the Broncos uh, was at the hospital NIP1 and texted, Logan is at the hospital. So we went to the hospital hoping to find Logan. But by the time we got there, he'd already been airlifted because he was one of the most severely injured. They suspected he'd be paralyzed from the waist down and he had a brainstem injury. So then uh, we left and we went to Saskatoon. three hours in the dark to Saskatoon from Nipwin. As fast as I could go safely, of course, because you can't really see much and it's dark and Bernie's looking for deer or moose or whatever coming from the shadows. All the way to RUH as we're driving, I kept thinking, okay, spinal cord injury, we can deal with that. We can get past that. Logan could be a Paralympian. He could play sledge hockey. He could do all kinds of things. And then we get there and we didn't get the news we had hoped for. We got to the hospital and we start going towards the ICU. We get to the doors, they said, no, you have to stop. You need to come this way first. Exactly what you see on TV, those little rooms that they take them to on TV. We went they explained some kind of counting system that he was on a scale of whatever out of 15 and they explained that he dropped on the scale and that there's nothing that they can do. Logan was not going to be able to recover from the brain stem injury. It was a matter of time till he passed. So Brady just asked, well, can we donate Logan's organs? And they looked at us, they just looked at us. It and didn't someone, come from them, said, them first, it came from us. It was just the right thing to do because Logan was not gonna survive. had organs that could help people to live better lives and to survive, and that was more what I was thinking, and that he may not be able to go on as we know him, but his organs could help people, and they could help people now. And then one of them said, well, was he a registered organ donor? Did he sign his donor card? He said, well, as far as I know, he did. And all of a sudden, a friend of Logan that was there with us had got in, he just goes, Oh, Logan's on his door card. We all literally like, what? Oh, when Logan turned 21, he, we sat in the vehicle and we talked for like an hour about organ donorship and why would you do that and what's good for society. And Logan told me he signed his donor card. And I looked at the lady and she goes, okay, away we go. So we got to go see Logan and it was... <sighs> he looked peaceful and he was on a respirator and he had a neck brace on. And he was laying in a bed in ICU and the, the people in ICU were incredible. They were so respectful. And I would put my head on his chest and listen to his heartbeat. His heart was really strong and... He never stopped beating us on. Then they brought the ultrasound in, and the technician said, I've been doing this for a lot of years. That's the strongest heart I've ever seen in a transplant. And to know that that heart is helping someone somewhere in Canada live an amazing life that, that their own heart was not allowing them to do. Apparently, there were um, over 450 families last year that denied the organ transplant because they weren't sure if that was their loved one's wishes. Or they didn't want that.
April 6th hit and uh, we found out about the, the accident and we were just as rocked as everybody else was. We started talking about you know, the effect and how it affected us and we wanted to do something to help. What can we do? What can we do? So we designed a shirt. Uh, we played with different designs. We played with different things and, and finally Shannon did the final tweak and we came up with We Are Humbled Strong and we loved the message. We came down back to work right away that morning, printed off the couple shirts, tweaked the artwork, fixed it up, took pictures, got it on social media, and we thought we were gonna go home for the day. We didn't get to leave. Uh, the, the impact was instant, um, and the orders were flooding in right away, and we, we printed as many shirts as we had that afternoon. We ran out of yellow ink by 6.30 that Saturday night. We had one of our uh, special clients volunteered he said where do I need to go I said Rocky it's Edmonton and he said I'm on my way he drove through the night and he met with our supplier in in Edmonton and uh, he picked up that ink cartridge that we needed and that just jarred the emotional roller coaster that we that we jumped on we had so many emails from people from all across the world. It was just literally by the thousands. They were telling us their story and how this had affected them. That's when we really realized how deeply we have affected people. So anyway, this is the shirt that started it all. We are Humbled Strong. And we started off with a, with a gray shirt and a white shirt, and that's what we printed and shipped worldwide. Uh, July 23rd, we presented a check to the Humboldt Strong Community Foundation for $304,239. It was, and that was based on our, our time, our labor, our blood, sweat, and tears. All we were cared about was helping those families. Well, little did we know that 10 weeks later, it was gonna be 15,000 shirts, and we affected people around the world. And that, I, I, I'm tingling right now as I say that. It, we've had many of those moments that, that when we really sit down and realize what, what it was that we did and how we affected people, we do, we get tingly and we get, did that really happen? As a little kid, I'd leave Saskatchewan to go live in the big city, Toronto. But uh, here I am, and I'm absolutely loving it. I was a slow reader to begin with, and then with the accident, I became even more of a slow reader. I have a reader that helps me read books if I need, but uh, I've been trying my best just to do it myself. Got my first report card back, and I'm not even a report card, is it? Report card, whatever it is. Got it back and uh, was happy with my mark so far. Caleb still does not have medical clearance to, to participate in anything contact related. So he has not played in a game and certainly we don't expect that that will happen this year. He goes in drills that are non-contact. He'll go on the ice maybe a little early before practice, stay on a little bit late, work on, you know, his game. He's in the gym a lot. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. I want it. Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. I think I might get treated a bit different. How am I supposed to know this drill? Just because I'm a Bronco and I was on the bus type of thing. And I just want to be treated like a normal person. So I, I told my teammates that at the start of the year. I was like, you know what, just treat me like a normal guy on the team. Don't treat me any different. And so I think they've all understood that. Oh, you're lucky there. We started following his career and then of course lo and behold he ends up being coached by Mark Cross so we feel like okay we've got a bit of an in there and we'll see how that goes you know I'm talking to Mark on a fairly regular basis and every time I talk to him he's like you know we're asking how's Caleb doing and every report coming back from Mark is like you guys have to take this kid he's hard working he's selfless he's first a volunteer for everything and it's pretty obvious he must be special Mark said like it was the best time of his life 
being at university and playing for the Lions. I wanted to follow in Mark's footsteps. I want to do this for Mark, and I know that Mark will be with me all the way through it. Mark wanted so badly for Caleb to be there. He said, that Caleb is just like me. He will do so much for the culture of that organization. All the way from Strasbourg, Saskatchewan, we now invite Mark Ross to come forward. He was the heartbeat and the leader of, of our team. I think everybody in here, their biggest worry was letting Mark down. As they score and they take the lead, it's Mark Cross now 2-1 to one for York. This coming Saturday will be the inaugural Mark Cross Memorial game. And we specifically chose that night because it'll be the 18th game of our regular season, and that was Mark's number. They've done so much to honor Mark at York. All the attention, keeping Mark's memory alive, it's been incredible. So it certainly shows what they thought of our son. We thought that but it was nice to see somebody else think that way. We would now like to ask the former Humboldt Bronco and current York Lion, Caleb Dahlgren, please join us at center ice. Caleb played for Mark last season and is representing those players in Mark's place. After the graduate of the award, It's been exciting. I think, obviously, no one expected us to be where we are, but it just goes to show the type of guys we have in the dressing room. There's not a lot that's easy with this entire organization. The board, the community, everyone. I'm still learning too. I make mistakes, uh, whether it's hockey wise or, you know, from the GM part, the business side. I make mistakes, but I just continue to try and learn from them and I kind of just put my head down and keep grinding away. Saskatoon Airport right now to pick up Tyler. It's gonna be good to reunite and hang out for the weekend. I think he's doing good. Everybody heals in their own way. And so for him to take a step back from the game, I think that's probably the best thing for him. I think it was great of him to give it a shot. And if it's not meant for him, then it's not meant for him. Didn't you just buy a Jeep? <laughs> That's good awesome. to see you. Good to see you too. How you doing? Good, how's the flight? I can't believe it's eight degrees in Saskatoon, man. I know. Like, come on. When's the last time you saw Lane? How was that? I don't know. They're probably a home opener. Yeah. Correct? Yep. Yeah, yeah I'd say probably home opener, so it's been a while. Yeah. That yeah, should be, it should be all right. All right, let's go see the big man. Let's do it. Holy, you're getting a workout on you. That's nice awesome. Hat, nice hat. That's my boy. So which one you got? Oh, the elliptical. I can't even do the elliptical. I'm going to get on, too. I'm going to get a good cardio workout in, eh, Lionel? Oh. <laughs> Having the boys come by to visit them, the smiles on their faces say it all. Do you have the pool often, Lane? Yeah? Yeah. 
You got some swimming in? He lights right up. They're a bond, they're a family, uh, forever. Give us there flex. Oh, oh, feel his pipes. All right, there we go. <laughs> it really warms my heart seeing them together again. <laughs> they care about each other so much. He's recovering, it's a slow progress. <laughs> Remember that Lionel? He's getting stronger and stronger. It's just the cognitive part of it. It's slow, <laughs> it's gonna take time, but it is getting better. His memories start getting better day to day, so we felt it was time to tell him about the accident. And it was hard for us, hard for him, but uh, he has to uh, learn about it to heal. We fully discussed the accident with Lane. We actually kept all the obituary cards and Lane read every obituary card. He does on a regular basis now. He had lots of questions and he keeps asking us if he can go to the accident scene, he wants to go. He is struggling with it, but uh, it's, it's just what happens. Are you actually gonna get a tattoo though? I'm gonna probably get a design here for Humboldt flock of birds in a formation, the V formation. Yeah, I got this too, so. You see yeah. this one, Lano? Yeah. Coach Darcy, eh? Yeah, that's a nice yeah. one. Yeah, I really like that. Said it was a snap of us. It's all we get in it. All right, all right. That's a good one. All right, save it. I had a great time seeing Lane today, I thought. It was really nice to spend time with him, especially in his natural setting, because like the hospital is not a natural setting. Yeah. Obviously to go from my lane was like before to this is obviously like it's a, it's a tough adjustment. But at the end of the day, like when I go visit lane, it's important for me to act normal. Like just don't act like there's anything wrong. It's awesome just to see him coming back to normal lane. Yeah. I don't think it brings back anything negative. I think it's all positive for me because I saw him in a coma. And so now to see him here, not even a year later, to see him here at this point is like phenomenal. And yeah. I believe we had an empty netter at the end, and uh, yeah, no, it was a really good game. I actually did have a lot of friends and family out here tonight. You know, being a 20 year old going into their last season, they want to be there for every moment, and uh, you know, it, it uh, really warms my heart that they, you know, want to come out and support. You always love playing in front of your friends, family, billets, all the people that supported us all season, all through our hockey careers. Every day you get out on the ice, you're playing for the guys that were on the team last year and the guys that are part of the team this year. And I mean, it, uh, it was emotional at the start. I mean, it's all I could think about through the first couple periods. But uh, once the game got going, it was just another game. And we stole home ice from them tonight, so that's huge. We can go back and do our home rink and hopefully win all three games we have to play there, but hopefully it doesn't have to get that far. The whole time we're out there, and right from when he pled guilty, I, I've said that I would welcome the opportunity to meet with Mr. Sidhu and talk about things. And uh, uh, that day, um, his cousin came up to me and asked if I'd like to meet with his family, and uh, so I did. Uh, I went into the room with uh, Mr. Sidhu, and it was unbelievable. I, I walked through the door first, and 
turned around and he was down on one knee and he grabbed both my hands and his tears were dripping off my hands onto the floor. And I stood up and I hugged him. And I hugged him for five minutes and when we separated, my shirt was wet with his tears. And he said, uh, basically what he said in court, that uh, he's sorry, he's so sorry. And then he didn't know what happened. Just didn't know. It was intensely powerful. It was probably the most emotionally exhilarating 10 minutes of my life. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to, to talk to him. Forgiveness is one of the highest things that you can achieve. He didn't ask for my forgiveness that day. I can yell and kick and scream and be angry all day, but it's not gonna bring Evan back. It's not gonna change the fact that we gotta move forward. He's a broken man. I mean, he is. So am I. where he started skating. Because I was a stay-at-home mom, I just decided to become caretaker of this rink so that he could always come here and he'd go to school and then he'd come here and hang out with his mom while I worked and he'd skate. Skate this way and hammer each one of them one at a time. He grew up with the rink. He's skated here his whole life. You know, he's getting stronger every day and he's working hard and it's... Nice even strides. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It takes time, but he's willing to put in the work, so we'll bring him here as much as he wants. Every single guy I've played with here, even guys that were here for short term, I still keep in touch with. It's just, it's a bond that never gets broken. I just opened up my eyes, like, every little thing, I just, I'm so grateful for. They're such a bigger picture. Little things don't bother me anymore like they used to. And now I have to live my life to the fullest for those 16 people that didn't make it. I'll always have a connection to Humboldt. The memories will always sit with me. I'll have the photos and videos on my phone for the rest of my life, and I plan to save those for absolutely the rest of my life. For those boys and for our son Evan, he was standing on the bus, putting his suit on, and the bus driver yelled, whoa. And he would have had time to take inhale once. He probably looked up, inhaled, and it was over. It was over for him that fast. As much as we think that that next second is guaranteed, his life was over in one breath. So there ain't no guarantees. Our life was changed in one breath. You can't take nothing for granted.
Sometimes at night I can hear the ice crack It sounds like thunder As it rips through my back Sometimes in the morning I still hear that sound Ice meets metal Can't you drop me down To the big leaves